photographs of American athletes. Some of these are so famous they've become iconic, and I'd love to share them with you, but we don't have the budget for that. <laughs> so instead, perhaps unwisely, I've decided to act a couple out. Forgive me in advance. Number one. Tommy Smith and John Carlos, right? 1968 Mexico City Olympics. The second one's cool. Requires some imagination. Forgive me. <laughs> MJ, you see it, right? <laughs> Maybe not. Michael Jordan. That was on the, my uh, posters on my bedroom wall for years. The third's a little more recent. <laughs> Megan Rapino? Anyone? Right. So most of us probably didn't know who Megan Rapino was until very recently. In 2019, she burst on the national scene as an amazing athlete, an outspoken and effective advocate. We came to know her as the, the highest goal scorer, the most valuable player, and the leader of the team that won the world championship. Now, if I ask you what made Megan Rapino such a dominant athlete, some of you might say it's hard work, it's determination, it's natural skill, and support of her communities and her family. And you'd be right. But others of you, you know who you are, are rubbing your chin and thinking, well, it's more than that. That it's, uh, she came of age in a certain time and place, that Megan Rapinoe benefited, we all benefited, from her coming of age in generations after Title IX legislation was passed. Title IX is the 1972 law that sought to give women equal access in education and athletic uh, opportunities. And that she benefited from coming of age in a, in a society that went from having 700 high school soccer players in 1972 to 400,000 female um, soccer players now. You'd be right, too. But I'm a historian. And my students will tell you that I've come to believe that things are a little more interesting when you dig a little deeper and understand the complexities of what lies behind the stories we've been told. And that's what I want to do tonight, is tell you about an amazing woman named Gladys Palmer, who became mindful of her students' frustrations with the athletic status quo, and sought to transform women's college athletics, and in doing so, helped pave the road to Title IX and to Megan Rapinoe. So here's the background. College athletics for women were really popular in the late 1800s and early 1900s. At Ohio State University, they'd get 1,500 people for a women's basketball game. They only had 500 women at the university. Across New England, there were <coughs> baseball teams at women's colleges, and they were popular. They played hard. They played well. They enjoyed it. And this went on for decades until these programs were eliminated in the 1920s. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's probably the guys, right? It must have been men who pulled the plug on these programs. But as I said, it gets a little more complicated and a little more interesting. It was women. Women helped eliminate these programs. And they did so because they wanted to create athletic programs that would prepare their students for life after college. Now, it's time for me to call time out for a second. There's an important caveat here. Most of the programs that were eliminated were eliminated at predominantly white institutions. At historically black colleges and universities, they kept most of their athletic programs for precisely the same reason that the educators were eliminating them at predominantly white institutions. At historically black colleges, they knew that black women, even college-educated edu black women, could not expect to live a life of leisure. They couldn't expect to be protected by society. And so their students needed to learn how to throw an elbow and to take one. And so we get quotes like this from um, Ruth Glover, who played basketball in North Carolina at Bennett College. As Glover says, we were ladies too. We just played basketball like boys. That's precisely the issue that the women at historically, at predominantly white institutions wanted to stop, playing sports like boys. What they wanted instead were a sport for every girl and every girl in a sport. They wanted equality broadly defined. They wanted what they called democratic sports. They didn't want elites separated from non-elite athletes. And they wanted to make sure women didn't get special attention, notoriety, or resources. And so they created programs to live up to this. One of the ways to understand their goals is to look at a slightly longer quote, if you'll excuse me. Um, 
This is from a male physical educator, but it captures the, the, the mood. Speaking bluntly, one of the most precious qualities of girls' characters is endangered by competition. Games like basketball and baseball are combative sports. They develop ugly muscles. <laughs> muscles ugly, girls. Um, as well as scowling faces in the competitive spirit. As an inevitable consequence, he tells these phys physical educators, um, your girls may find it more difficult to attract the most worthy fathers for their children. I hear you nodding in agreement. But, uh, <laughs> but there are a lot of assumptions here. And in my, with my, my classes, we would unpack this for 20 minutes. Right? The assumptions are heterosexuality. The assumptions are motherhood being the desire for women and the proper desire for women. The assumption is that a muscular body cannot be an attractive body. But the underlying assumption is that competition is bad because it takes women down the wrong path. So they created a whole series of programs designed to control women's bodies and to teach them not to be competitive. And some of these just seem absurd in retrospect. At the University of Tennessee, they had intramural programs. And women would start on one side, and they'd run over here, and they'd thread a needle. <laughs> and they'd run back, <laughs> and they'd darn a sock or do something else, domestic and feminine. They would be fit. They would protect what they called their vital organs, their reproductive capability. But they would also get the lesson they're supposed to be feminine. They also had rules in schools ranging from California to Tennessee to control, help women learn how to control their bodies and to um, protect them. So at some of these schools, you could get points towards an athletic letter, uh, which is smaller than the men's athletic letter, of course, but, but points towards an athletic letter by doing certain things. No Coca-Cola. All right, it'd be tougher for some of us than others. Uh, no um, sleeping from lights out till sunrise, 23 out of 30 days by evacuating your bowels daily, preferably after breakfast, the rule says. Now, I've spent a lot of time in archives. I've never seen rules like this for men, and I've never figured out who was in charge of monitoring it. Because <laughs> that person wasn't getting paid enough, even during the Depression. Uh, but, so these are at individual institutions. The, the broader scope was that they created institutions called play dates, and then you can see the emphasis in the title. Play, day. Play, not competition. Day, episodic, not league-wide or season-long. And on these, in these events, what they would do is they'd have women from different institutions show up. So women from Salem State and Gordon and Endicott would come together, but they would not represent their schools. They wouldn't play for institutional pride. Instead, what they do is they'd mix them all up so there'd be a red team and a blue team and a green team and a yellow team, and they'd have rules, no scoreboards. Right? No press, um, no medals, certainly, no trophies. And sometimes they mix them up during the, the event so the red team and the blue team aren't staring at each other across the field thinking, hey, we're going to win this. This was a system that was in place from the 1920s through the 1930s. And this is a system that Gladys Palmer wanted to attack, wanted to transform. So who's Gladys Palmer? Gladys Palmer was this innovative physical educator. She helped write the rules for softball. Gladys Palmer was employed by Ohio State, and she moved up in the ranks. She became the director of women's physical education when her predecessor died early. Palmer moved up a generation early before she was supposed to. And Palmer knew her students and knew how frustrated they were. She had one student called Helen Jenkins, named Helen Jenkins. And Helen just wanted to shoot. All she wanted to do was be on the rifle team. She said it was her lifelong ambition to be an all-American rifle shooter. And she was good. The male coach said, yeah, she can be on my team. But they took this petition to the athletic director and said, nope, women can't compete. That's wrong. Palmer knew this. She knew that other students were frustrated as well. And she started to challenge the system. In 1938, they wrote an essay innocuously titled Policies on Women's Athletics, in which they suggested that it is impossible to legislate out of an individual the instinctive urge to compete. <coughs> Competition, they wrote, is the very soul of athletics. The competitive instinct wasn't masculine, it was human. Palmer believed that you could be both feminine, muscular, and competitive, that this was natural and right. And she put this out for a profession, hoping they would agree with her. <laughs> she was wrong. 
Uh, she put it out there. They, she's waiting. They go to conferences. The Ohio State contingent would sit down at a table. Educators from other places would get up and walk away. They waited. They got some letters of support, but never any public statement of support. And in 1941, after three years of waiting, they said, okay, let's go. They published an, an essay called Concerning Competition. Again, competition is the focus. And they proposed a national golf tournament for women. They're going to keep score. They're going to compete. They're going to give a trophy to the winner. Mary Yost, one of Palmer's colleagues, went to a conference and shared this idea with her colleagues. And she sent a, telegraph, a telegram back to Palmer. It read simply, bombshell exploded, shrapnel flew wildly. <laughs> now, I'm no linguist, but I would tell you that that's not a good sign. They are waiting. They're sitting there waiting. They put their professional reputations on the line. They're waiting for women to apply. But no one's applying. No one's applying. What they realized, though, is their form required the signature of approval from the physical educators at these other schools, the ones who didn't want them to succeed. So they changed the form. Those of us who worked in bureaucracies know how important forms are. <laughs> so you change the form, and suddenly applications were flying in. They had applications from 21, I think, schools. They had um, dozens of applications from around the country. And they hold a golf tournament in the summer of 1941. 30-something white women wearing dresses playing golf. Doesn't necessarily seem like a radical act. <laughs> One of the women didn't have a dress that was nice enough. They took her downtown and got her a good dress. Um, they had tea with the president. This doesn't seem like radicalism. But it was an important challenge to the status quo. They kept score. The winning golfer shot a 75 on the course where the men had had their national tournament the week before. It's a tough course. That's a good score. They had fun. One of the women from Michigan State said, if I know it's going to be this good, I would have failed some more classes so I can come back next year. Um, and they were already thinking about next year. Gladys Palmer said in her closing remarks that there's nothing here, not professional scorn, that can prevent us from doing this again unless we're at war. This was the summer of 1941. Right? Your history teachers are proud somewhere. Um, <laughs> Yeah, December 1941, the Japanese Empire attacks the United States. The country is preoccupied by Pearl Harbor in the aftermath for the next several years. But 1946, tournaments at Ohio State. 47, and then Columbus. 48, Ohio State. 49, 50, 51, 52 at Ohio State. And 53, somewhere else. 54, somewhere else. By the mid-50s, these professional organizations were willing to form a committee. This is how bureaucracies work. They formed a committee to investigate whether it was proper for women to have competitive golf tournaments. It's progress. This is a, a decade and a half before Title IX and helped pave the way, open the conversation to Title IX and the changes that have come from it. From this story, I take three lessons. The first is that it's okay to challenge the conventional wisdom. Sometimes it's necessary, right? If there are policies in place, if there are understandings that are based on faulty data, we need to question that and challenge that. Two, sometimes we need the young to lead us. We're seeing this in today's environment. If Gladys Palmer and Mary Yost and others had waited until it was their turn, until they had standing, until they had you know, seniority, generations, perhaps, of college women wouldn't have had the opportunity to compete or dreamed about it. And third, it can take courage to act on these convictions. They risk their livelihoods during the Great Depression, professional relationships, friendships, to act on behalf of others and to try to change a system they thought was unfair. I know this. Megan Rapino has probably never heard of Gladys Palmer. But I also know this. Without Gladys Palmer and some of the changes she helped create, we may never have heard of Megan Rapino. Thank you. Thank you.